Hello, welcome to this last video in this series um, looking at the derivative of trig functions, the derivative of exponential functions. Um, this video will be a bunch of examples uh, mostly focused on the trig derivatives. So we have this function, it's a quotient. We have cosine x over 1 plus sine x. And we're interested in knowing the slope of the tangent line when x is equal to pi over 6. So just a good chance to show that we know the quotient rule. Take the bottom and square it, bring the bottom up to the top, take the derivative of the top. Um, cosine derivative is negative sine of x. Put a minus sign, leave the top alone, take the derivative of the bottom. 1's derivative is 0, sine x's derivative is cosine x. So we get this expression for the derivative. Distribute across, and what you'll see is negative sine x, negative sine squared x, and negative cosine squared x. Okay. Now, hidden in that is a sine squared plus cosine squared. If you factor out the negative 1 from the last two terms, you'll have your sine squared plus cosine squared, which is definitely 1. Something strange happens here, too. At this point, we could factor out a negative 1 from the numerator, and we'd have, I'm going to write it in the reverse order, 1 plus sine x. Why would I write it like that? So you can look at the denominator and see the cancellation that happens. So it's very strange, but it happens. And we end up with the following for our derivative, negative 1 on top of 1 plus sine x. Okay. And um, we're evaluating this derivative when x is pi over 6. So the sine of pi over 6, that's the 30 degrees, right? That's going to be a half. Negative 1 on top of 1 plus a half, so negative 1 on top of 3 halves. It's the same thing as saying negative 2 thirds. That's your tangent line slope. Okay, so some strange algebra or trig, trig identities turned out to give us a lot of cancellation. Nice doable question. Executing the quotient rule, bring it in sine and cosine. Good question. Okay, now back to the second derivative notion again. It's the derivative of the derivative. Okay, our function is cosecant x, not our standard sine or cosine, but that's okay. Um, go back a couple of videos and you'll see the derivative of cosecant x. Just, just given to you. We didn't derive it. We can derive it if you want, but um, just treat cosecant as the reciprocal of sine. And you could work it out and figure out, you know, why its derivative is what it is. Um, and so... We need to take the second derivative and evaluate it at pi over 6. So we start with the first derivative. Uh, cosecant x's derivative is defined to be negative cosecant x, cotangent x. Okay, great. And now we have to take the derivative of that. It's a product rule. And so the negative 1, it can just be carried down. Okay, um, cosecant's derivative is negative cosecant cotangent. So the, the negative from here and the negative from cosecant x's derivative cancel each other out. This probably should have been written up better. I should have put those negatives in there. But that's okay. Uh, times the second function plus the first function. And now we multiply by cotan's derivative, which is negative cosecant squared. We're done. As far as the calculus goes, this is our second derivative. We can actually plug right into this. Let's try to fix it up a little bit. In the first term, cotan and cotan are together. So that's cosecant times cotan squared. And in the second term, we have basically three of these cosecants. So negative cosecant cubed and a negative um, times a negative would make it a positive, actually, plus cosecant cubed. This is your second derivative. We could plug into this, or we could go another step further. Let's go ahead and just plug into this. All right, what is the cosecant of pi over 6? What is the cotangent of pi over 6? If we know the sine of pi over 6, then we can know the cosecant of pi over 6. All right? So we could actually put this whole thing in terms of sine and cosine to be more familiar. 
the sine of pi over 6 is a half. We saw it earlier. And then the cosine of pi over 6 would be root 3 over 2. So we just replace these guys. Half of the, all the guys in the denominator, and that guy up there is a root 3 over 2. Well, 1 divided by a half, that's a 2. Um, we have a, a root 3 over 2 for the numerator. There's some steps that are definitely skipped here. Sorry about that. And then a 1 half for the denominator. And so what happens is those 2s cancel out. Then you just end up with root 3, who you have to square. And then the other term is, is just a 2 because it's 1 over a half again. But that 2 is cubed, though. So you end up with a nice integer value for the second derivative. Uh, root 3 squared is a 3. So 6 plus the 8, 14. Well, that was interesting how that worked out. Unexpected to have such a nice integer answer like that. Let's do one more. This will be an interesting example here. So we're talking about these higher order derivatives. And recognizing that the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. Now we're going to go a little bit wacky with it and ask a really higher order derivative. I'm asking you to take the derivative of sine x, but not just the first derivative, the 157th derivative. Crazy. Okay. What's going to happen is that we're going to recognize a pattern. You see, we know that sine x's derivative is cosine x. Now let's take a second derivative. We know that cosine x's derivative is negative sine of x. We take a third derivative. So negative sine x's derivative is going to be negative cosine x. All right, here's the key here. The fourth derivative. Negative cosine x's derivative. Well, you keep the negative, and then another negative comes in. So it's positive sine of x. And you start this cycle all over again. Sine x's derivative is cosine x. Cosine x's derivative is negative sine x. After a while, you can't keep cutting prime symbols, so you put parentheses. And put a number in the parentheses, that's to indicate that derivative. And so this, this repeats in cycles of fours. You just got to know where you're at on the cycle. Okay. And so um, the pattern continues. That's what the dot, dot, dot means there. Okay. Um, the number derivative you're at, if it's a multiple of four, if the, if the number derivative is a multiple of four, you'll be at that level. Right? The, the, uh, the zero, the fourth, the eighth, you'll be at that level. And then if, if you're multiple of four, the remainder is zero. But then if you are one more than that, you'll be remainder one, you'll be at that second level. Like uh, five and nine and 13. These are all remainder ones when you divide by four. You'll be at the second level if your remainder is one. If your remainder is two, you'll be at the third level, like six and 10 and and 14, you divide by 4, you get a remainder of 2 for all those guys. And then finally, end up at the fourth level, that's going to be because your remainder is 3. So if you can just figure out what your remainder is, that can tell you what level you're on. Take 157 and divide by 4. And you'll get a remainder of 1. So you should be at the same place as y prime, the same place as the fifth derivative, the same place as the ninth derivative, because your remainder is equal to 1. The, the 157th derivative of sine of x is just cosine x. Okay, that was a fun little exercise. I didn't, really didn't want you to take 50, 157 derivatives. Um, find out where you're at on the cycle. Okay, it's kind of like... Um, taking i and raising it to powers. Same kind of scene, cycle of four. All right. Thank you so much for watching these videos. My name is Nakai Rimmer. Please like and subscribe. Comment down below. I'll be happy to help you reach out to me if you need some help. Take care. I'll see you in the next video.